this computer. Okay, thank you for telling me. Okay, does, does everything look okay? Yeah, that's good. All right, so again with the logistics, so we do have the uh, discussion section later today, and I, I've been asking you what subjects you want to cover, and there's a actually e it was an email, you know, how exactly we actually de derive this, uh, the, the temperature dependent potential so that the coefficient of phi squared goes like T minus TC. So I plan to actually discuss that. And uh, a couple of people mentioned some other topics on, on, on Tuesday. I actually forgot what they were. So can you remind me what you wanted me to talk about? I think in particular I had like correction factor on vertex diagrams and the beta function. But I sent you an email on that. So it should be somewhere. A correction factor? What do you mean by this? Um, there's a few diagrams that you need when you're calculating beta functions that are like those um, vertex diagrams. Uh -huh. For some reason, they keep missing like a factor of negative i. And there's also a, like a little, like there's a whole question on it of beta functions in the email. Factors of negative i in vertex correction. What theory is this? Um, it's just QED. For QED and QED. The, yeah. Okay. All right. So I can look into that. Anything else? Uh, I'm also curious about the relative order uh, between beta and gamma in the kalin simons equation. Uh, in beta and gamma in kalin simons equation. What do you mean relative order? It seems like uh, in some computations you can ignore gamma and then find beta and in some computations you can ignore beta and find gamma. Uh, I think the author used the argument that, for example, uh, some, sometimes beta is O lambda squared and sometimes O gamma is order lambda, so you can ignore one relative to the other and something like that. Okay, so is this in the context of a, a nonlinear sigma model? We had some discussions about that in the, uh, the office hour. Oh, yes, but I guess this one is more general. Uh, more general. Yeah. Okay, so let me see what I can do about that. Anything else? Okay, so if you think of some other topics, then uh, what, wait, uh, wait, do email thing. me. Oh, okay, go <laughs> on, Andres. You know how you can calculate the beta functions from like the derivatives of the counter terms? Uh -huh. um, I think there's a, they gave us a way of doing it for one loop order, but I couldn't mm -hmm. figure out the way to do it for two loops. That's the piece of one Okay. I guess the logic is somewhat missing. Uh, all right. So that, that may not be uh, a simple calculations, but let, let me see what I can do. Okay. Anything, anything else? Okay, good. So let me look into this and, and see uh, which one I can cover today. All right, so now we go to non abelian gauge theory as advertised. So uh, this is what we did with the Abelian uh, gauge theory, and we would like to actually extend this to non abelian gauge groups. So uh, we have this uh, Lagrangian for QED. We know the, uh, uh, the, the, the gauge transformation on the field is by this phase transformation. So we established why change of the gauge in the gauge field uh, is related to the change of the phase by using point particle Lagrangian uh, on Tuesday. So I hope that made sense. So uh, this change of the phase is what should accompany this uh, uh, gauge change in the gauge field. And, and so the key uh, in writing down the gauge invariant Lagrangian is to use this covariant derivative, which you know very well, the del mu minus i e a mu. And the definition of uh, this derivative being covariant is that if you sandwich this derivative by the gauge transformation from both sides, which is the unitary transformation, then you can just work it out. So uh, you pick up the derivative of this phase theta, uh, which gives you additional contribution to the gauge field A mu. And this combination is nothing but the new gauge field in the new gauge. And therefore, this derivative uh, changes from one gauge to another in covariant fashion. And that's why I, we can use this uh, combination of the covariant derivative in the Lagrangian to write down the gauge invariant Lagrangian. So that was the idea in QED. 
So basically, all we need to do is to change this gauge transformation by a phase to a transformation by a matrix. <clears throat> so now we view this psi to be a multi-component object. Uh, for example, if you have a two by two unitary matrix, the psi is a two component a vector, a column vector. And so it changes from one gauge psi to another gauge psi prime by the action of this uh, space-time dependent matrix U. So that's the now uh, non-Abelian gauge transformation. So again, it's non-Abelian because the two by two matrices don't necessarily commute with each other and hence non-Abelian, it's non-commutative. So the idea is to come up with the transformation of the gauge field consistent with this change of the <coughs> matter field of psi. And so what we need to do is to introduce this covariant derivative with the gauge field A mu, but A mu itself is now a matrix. So uh, the A mu is now a two by two matrix. So you can expand this in the, the linear basis of the independent <coughs> matrices in, 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 in two by two space. And so that would be the Pauli matrices, basically. And if you have bigger matrices, again, you can find a linearly independent basis of all the matrices you can consider on that space. <coughs> then write this gauge field in a linear combination of them. <coughs> so uh, then the covariance of the covariant derivative is the same idea as in the case of the Abelian or U1 case, namely that I replace this e to the ie theta, which is transformation of the matter field, now by matrix U, so this is replaced by U. <coughs> then, <coughs> excuse me, let me sip a water. <coughs> Just in case you're wondering, I have a uh, chronic case of asthma, so uh, the, 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 the fact that I'm coughing has nothing to do with the coronavirus. So uh, just to be clear on this. So, so this e to the minus i theta is the inverse matrix U dagger. So this is how the covariant derivative should transform. And then I can just work it out what this A prime should be to be consistent with the transformation property. And that turns out to be this. So it looks a little bit more complicated than the Abelian case. But the first thing you want to check is the fact that if you uh, specialize this back into just the phase factor, then A mu with a phase would commute in that case. So this is the piece that goes back to A mu times the coupling constant. And this is the piece that gives you gradient theta. And uh, so I, I forgot to tell you that the coupling constant, I now denote the coupling constant by G instead of V because just it happens to be a common notation in literature. And I don't know why, but anyway, that's the case. And maybe G stands for gauge, I don't know. And, and so, uh, so that's why there's a G factor here. And so what I'm telling you is that in the case when U is just the phase factor, then this is A mu, and this is del mu theta. So that recovers the gauge transformation for the original QED case. But when U is really a matrix, then U and A mu may not commute because A mu itself is of this matrix form. So that's why this looks a little bit more complicated. But at least I hope you see that it's exactly the same idea of what we have doing in a QED case. It's just generalized to uh, the N by N matrix. Okay, so before going to the next slide, any questions about this? Um, maybe this is kind of a minor point, but I feel like okay. it's something often on confused about. You have U dagger, and then the operator, and then U is yeah, representing right. the action of the transformation on this operator. Mm -hmm. Should it not be U D mu U dagger? Because if you were to sandwich U U dagger between D mu and what it's acting on, you want all the U's to cancel out. So I'm looking up above. Psi transforms as e to the i e phi with a plus sign, so like with a u. So if you wanted to have like, if you had the object d mu psi, and you stick a u dagger u between the two of them, you want the whole object to not change, yeah? Um, I, I think that's the, 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 um, the different point of view. So what I'm doing is substitute psi by u psi prime. So I put u psi prime here, mm -hmm. and then psi prime bar u dagger here. Mm -hmm. So that's the combination u dagger d mu 
you. Mm -hmm. That's this. Right. Then I'm trying to rewrite it using DMU prime so that at the end of the day, I have cyber prime, DMU prime, and psi prime. Ah, and then okay. working out what D prime is supposed to be. I see. And so if you perform the right. gate transformation, you, you change the fields, but then you don't also change the derivatives. It's just that. <coughs> Well, so, so the changing the field is a little bit confusing. So uh, to a modern point of view, uh, based on a path integral approach, is that psi is just a dummy variable of the path integration. And I'm allowed to change the variable from psi to u psi prime. So that's a substitution I'm making. Yeah. So the, in, in sort of a, when, when people talk about symmetry transformations, often people uh, say, okay, I, I'm going to actually change Psi to U Psi. And that's not the way I'm actually looking at it. So this is just a substitution of changing Psi to U Psi prime. And, and the either is fine, but this way of looking at it is, is least confusing to me because it's just a change of variable in the path integral. So I'm okay. sticking to that approach when I talk about the symmetry transformations. Okay. Okay, all right. Well, thanks for asking. Any other questions here? Good, so I think this idea is whole, all straightforward. And then uh, we uh, try to actually uh, work out the, what field strength should be. So we need field strength because we need to write a kinetic term uh, for the gauge field. And so we came up with this idea that the field strength can be written as a commutator of the covariant derivatives. So we actually use this in a case of abelian gauge theory on Tuesday. And then we can use the same idea also for non abelian gauge field. So writing this commutator between d mu and d nu, I can define what the field strength f mu nu should be. And so then you can try to see how this transforms. So if you go to new gauge, then this is d mu prime, d nu prime. And I, there's a typo that should be a, a square bracket here. So uh, the, then the, I just re rewrite d mu prime by definition, u dagger d mu u, and the same for d nu prime. Then u and u dagger in the middle cancel, so I can take u dagger nu out to the front and, and the end of the commutator. And we, we said the definition of mu nu is nothing but the thing in the middle. So this is u dagger f mu nu u. And I can factor minus ie out. And then this should be the new field strength f prime. So if u were again just a phase uh, back in QED, then the phase would commute with everything because just a number. And therefore f mu nu is the same thing as f mu nu prime. And hence the field strength is gauge invariant. But what's uh, now different in the non evident gauge theory is that F mu nu itself now becomes a matrix, so may not commute with you. So F mu nu is no longer gauge invariant. And that was uh, actually shocking uh, uh, the, because we always thought that the field strength is something you can measure uh, uh, as an observable. But what we are seeing here is that even the field strength is actually not observable because it's gauge covariant, not gauge invariant. Uh, so that's uh, the point here, field strength is not gauge invariant, but it's rather gauge covariant. So, but, uh, uh, but on the other hand, if you try to write down the, uh, the kinetic term for the gauge field, I write f mu nu, f mu nu, but it's because f mu nu is a matrix, I take a trace of that. But inside the trace, I can do a cyclic permutation of the matrices. So when f mu nu changes, uh, is replaced by u f mu nu prime u dagger, and that's what we have um, worked out over here, and same here, then u dagger u in the middle cancel, and I cyclically permute this u to the end of the trace, so that cancels this u dagger. So it's the same thing as trace f prime f prime. So the kinetic term is invariant. So that's why we can use this as a part of the Lagrangian, but not the field strength itself. Okay, so any questions about this? Is there any particular reason we used to trace and not some other mathematical operation that we can get a scale from? Like what? Like, no, I know, that, that's what I'm wondering. Like, I can't come up with something, but is there something that other people came up with? 
Um, one other thing you can do is a profian. So if mu nu is a, uh, 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 well, no, 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 what I'm saying, no, de determinant, right? So if mu nu is a matrix, and if you take a determinant, then determinant of f mu nu is replaced by uh, determinant of this u dagger f mu nu u, and then determinant factors into the determinant of each matrices, and determinant u dagger and determinant u cancel. So that's another way you can build a, uh, a invariant. But if you have an n by n matrix, determinant is a, uh, uh, the power n of the component, so that becomes a non-renormalizable term. So that's why we are not using it. Okay, okay, I see, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, good. So then the end result is the following. So we have this kinetic term for the matter field. Now matter field is this multi-component column vector. And this is the covariant derivative where A mu is now the matrix. I can write the mass term in the same usual way. And then I have this kinetic term for the gauge field. And you might be wondering why this is one half instead of one quarter. And that's because we typically normalize the generator of this, uh, the linear basis of the matrices TA, which I had on the previous slide, this TA. Oh no, on this slide too, I'm sorry. And this TA is typically normalized at trace of TA times TB is half delta AB. And that's the convention physicists adopted, I guess, in the spin matrices. So the spin matrix half poly matrices. And the trace of the spin matrix A, spin matrix B, turns out to be half delta AB. So we are sticking to that convention of how to normalize the generators. And mathematicians tend to leave one factor one half out in the definition of generators. So they tend to use trace TA, TB to, to be two times delta AB instead of a half times delta AB. But anyway, that's just a matter of convention. So using physicist convention, that taking trace of the generators give you additional factor of a half. So that's why this ends up being a quarter, which goes back to the same normalization you had in the QED. So having worked out the gauge transformation law, now we would like to understand how the infinitesimal gauge transformation works because we actually end up using it later when we quantize the gauge field. So the infinitesimal gauge transformation is given by uh, writing this matrix U in terms of the thing in exponent omega. Because this is a unitary matrix, it should be able to be written as e to the i times the Hermitian matrix omega. And so I do the power series expansion in omega, assuming it's infinitesimal. So it starts with one unit matrix and I omega and higher orders. So using the expansion, I can just work out what this gauge transformation is for infinitesimal omega. And, and just I just run through this calculation and I find this expression over here. And once again, we can check if this goes back to uh, 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 what we started out with. And uh, I realized that I actually dropped out the, the leading piece A mu when I go from this stage to that stage. So this is A mu plus this one. I apologize, let me, let me fix that later. So this is A mu plus this one. So this is a piece uh, that comes from the transformation. And when uh, omega is just a, a phase, namely there's just a number theta, then that commutes with A mu, so second term vanishes. So all there is is this set, the derivative of uh, omega. And we used to write this omega as e times theta. So that cancels this one over e in the case of QED. So I, you end up with the transformation, which is the graph theta. So that's something we're familiar with. But now that this omega is a matrix, this commutator may not vanish. So I have two pieces here. One is the derivative of the gauge parameter omega. But there's another piece which comes from the commutator of the gauge field with omega. And the standard notation is to write this whole combination in the parentheses as the covariant derivative of acting on omega. And as you can see, that reproduces this one because covariant derivative is del mu minus ig a mu. Uh, commutator of the partial derivative in omega is nothing but the partial derivative acting on omega. And then additional pieces, a mu time, uh, uh, the omega commutator, that's the second term here. So this is the shorthand notation on writing down the infinitesimal gauge transformation. 
And the way it works in the field strength is that this del mu del nu is now the uh, the, the field strength. So I can just write this out, <clears throat> first of all. So by sticking in partial derivative minus IgA mu here and also for d nu, then I can just write out this explicitly. And knowing that this A mu is a matrix given in terms of A mu A times T A summed over A, I can also write this out explicitly as well. So this A nu now becomes A nu A times T A. This A mu becomes A mu A times T A. And this A mu A nu commutator, this is you know just a reminder of what we have discussed on Tuesday, the commutator among the generators is given in terms of this uh, structure constant F A B C. And so uh, I, I get FABC times A mu, a, a, let's say TA, a, a nu TB. And, but uh, uh, we would like to extract something that's proportional to TA. So I need to actually rewrite these labels uh, uh, in a way that I can extract TA. So that ends up taking actually B component here, C component there, and, and find this form of the structure constant. And here I use this uh, property that uh, FABC is totally antisymmetric. So I cyclically permutated ABC to come up with this form at the end of the day. So this is an explicit uh, form of the field strength. And what's really new here is that the uh, field strength now contains a piece which is quadratic in the gauge field together with the coupling constant. And we didn't have this for the abelian gauge theory because structure constant vanishes. So this piece ends up giving you new terms uh, for the Feynman vertices when we actually quantize the theory and start looking at interactions among the, each other. And so this is the new piece we need to keep track of. And having written down to what the field strength is, the next thing is to understand infinitesimal case transformation. And that's actually fairly trivial because all you need to do is stick in u uh, expanded in this i to uh, one plus i omega. So f mu nu plus i omega and f commutator is the, the first order piece in omega coming from the infinitesimal gauge transformation. Okay, so any questions about this? Okay. Yeah, I, I have a quick question. Okay, um, go ahead. So the third line from the bottom, uh, the commutator with a, a mu and a nu, the commutator mm -hmm. there. Uh, so going to the next line down mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, so what's happening here is that a mu equals a mu b times t b, mm -hmm. and, and then you can just factor out the a mu b because that's a number. Mm -hmm. And then you're just doing the commutator of TB, TC. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Right. Okay. Um, all right. I just want well, to. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. You got it. Those steps properly. Um, and also, in terms of the, uh, the last line there for the infinitesimal, uh, yeah. Um, is, is there some way of understanding this in terms of uh, like a, a Lie derivative? Um, like I believe that's right. Yeah, yeah. So this is a lead derivative. Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's it for me. Good. Any other questions? All right. Let me go to the next slide. So now we have uh, worked out how gauge transformation works on both gauge field and field strength. We also have explicit expression for the uh, field strength. And now we spend a little bit of time on trying to understand what actually gauge theory is. And there is actually <coughs> geometric meaning to the gauge theory. And the Pushkin Schroeder spent some time actually talking about this. I'd like to repeat that as well. And because that's also relevant when we actually briefly talk about how we actually put the gauge theory on the computer and, and do a brute force path integral on it. So the, the, to understand the geometric meaning of it, let us actually lattice the space time. And here for simplicity, I'm looking only at the one dimension of space and, and also Euclidean. So uh, uh, the, when you have, let's say the scalar field, which transforms on a gauge transformation. So think back about the scalar QED we discussed on Tuesday. So you place the scalar field at every position in space-time, or it's a Euclidean space-time in this case. So on the every lattice site, we have field phi i. So i refers to the lattice label. 
And uh, th this is something we have done uh, in, in homework problem, I believe. Uh, so if you actually write down this combination, so the phi i goes to phi i plus i, uh, phi i plus one goes to phi i and so on. So this combination uh, in the limit where lattice constants goes to small number uh, can be approximated by this derivative. So this is the way you write the lattice version of the uh, Klein-Gordon field. And, and you have done this for the, uh, uh, actually, the spin system in a previous homework problem. Um, so how do we actually generalize this in a way that, that this becomes gauge invariant? Now you are faced with the following dilemma. So when you write this term of phi i plus one times phi i, you are basically comparing phi i to phi i plus one, so that this comparison eventually turns into this derivative. But under gauge transformation, each phi i transforms independently from each other because this gauge transformation u is also a function of space time. So on each lattice site, u matrix can be different from each other. And that's the spirit of this local symmetry, right? So on every lattice site i, I have its own gauge transformation ui. Namely that phi i and phi i plus one, the next lattice site, transform differently. So then there's no way of comparing them against each other. So it's basically an apples and oranges. So the phi at site i is an apple, phi at site i plus one is an orange, and we don't know how to compare them against each other. So that's, that's the dilemma. So in order to solve this dilemma, we need to find a way of comparing phi i and phi i plus one to, by making sure that you have some combination of them that transform the same way. And for this purpose, we introduce a variable called link variable. And link variable, as the name suggests, lives on link. So if you have the site, phi, uh, site i and site i plus one, this link variable vji lives on this link between site i and i plus one. And we will see that this actually goes back to the gauge field when you take the limit of the continuum theory. Uh, but anyway, so that's what we introduce on the lattice for the moment. And we demand that this link variable transforms in this way. And uh, there's a typo here, I apologize. So link variable vji transforms by uj dagger vji, and this is ui. So that, that was something I need to fix. So using this link variable, then I can finally compare, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I actually wrote it right. So VJI goes to UJ dagger VJI UI. So given this transformation property of the link variable, if I multiply this link variable on phi at site I, then this VJI transforms this way. I have UI here. Phi I transforms to UI phi I, so UI cancels, and I, again, I probably made a mistake here. This has to be dagger here, and then and, and no, no dagger over here. So that transforms to UJ, VJI, Phi I. So no dagger here, I'm sorry. So this combination of VJI times Phi I now transforms the same way as Phi J, so that I can compare them against each other. So they are now both apples. So using this link variable, then I can write this following gauge invariant, uh, the action. So phi star i plus i, uh, i plus one star, or dagger, vji, vi plus one i times phi i. So phi i transformed by ui, and ui part of the transformational link variable cancels here, and vi plus one cancel, uh, the transforms like u dagger, uh, ui plus one, and this transforms by u dagger i plus one, so that cancels against each other here. So this combination is now gauge invariant. And same here. And this term is the uh, on the same side, so this is already gauge invariant to begin with. And then I'm asking you through this exercise in a new homework problem that if you write this vji to be exponential of the line integral of the gauge field from site i to site j because it's living on in between the sites, then this 
action really does reduce to the covariant derivative of phi. So the, this is the way you start to seeing some geometrical meaning of the gauge field. And the mathematicians call this AMU a connection because this AMU is, is what allows you to connect the, the, uh, the, the variable on side i to variable on side i plus one. So that, that allows you a fair comparison between the fields at different locations in space time. And I put a little symbol p here. So if this were a abelian gauge field, and I try to do, I used it on the next slide, and that's what you're supposed to do in the homework problem as well, then I don't need to worry about how a mu is ordered. But when you actually talk about a mu as a matrix, and this align integral going from side i to side j, then I, I'm basically multiplying this matrix from side i to j uh, together to define this uh, the exponential. So this is what is done uh, in, 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 uh, to ensure this correct transformation property. This P is meant to be path ordered. <clears throat> so just in that case of the time ordered product, and you have seen this kind of expression before in time-dependent perturbation theory. You define e to the minus ie of this uh, uh, the interaction Hamiltonian, dt, and you time order it. So the meaning of this exponential is by writing down in the, uh, um, uh, 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 the Taylor expansion in this exponent. But when you have the interaction of Hamiltonian multiple times in the n power of the exponent, then you order interaction Hamiltonian according to time ordering. So that's something we have done before in a time-dependent perturbation theory. So here we're doing the same thing in path-ordered way, namely that when I write out this uh, uh, exponent and expand this into, say, n power in the exponent, then I have a mu multiplied n times uh, in the expansion, and then I path-order them from uh, the direction of coming from the site I to site J. And you can prove that when you do this path ordering, then transformation property is really that of given here with this mistake that this is no dagger, here is this dagger. So that's how you can actually obtain this VJI as a uh, uh, the integral, line integral of the gauge field, both for Abelian and non-Abelian case. So that's why this link variable in the continuum limit corresponds to the gauge field. But if you do have the theory in the lattice, you live with the link variables directly without writing it in terms of the gauge field. So in the end, so this is the way you can write a gauge invariant action uh, on the lattice. And if you take the continuum limit of it, then you do recover the covariant derivative uh, 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 and, 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 and in, the, in the continuum action. And in some sense, this is guaranteed because all we made sure here is to make sure that this is gauge invariant, and we know in order to write the gauge invariant uh, the action, it has to come with a covariant derivative. So uh, this is basically the only thing that can come out of it, but you can actually verify this explicitly, and that's what you're supposed to do uh, for the Abelian case in a homework problem. So this is the, the, uh, the definition of the link variable, namely the link variable is supposed to actually allow you to a, a fair comparison of the fields at different lattice sites or at different points in space time. And this VJI is also sometimes called the parallel transport. And the meaning of parallel transport will come on, uh, on the next slide. But anyway, any questions about this? So one, one cool question. So the, the lad, the when we're doing this discretization, mm -hmm. we're discretizing where the field exists, but not the entire background behind it, right? Because mm -hmm. we're still writing that connection, and that seems like it depends, like the whole continuum back. Um. So so I, I wrote this out uh, in in order to allow for a continuum limit. But if you really take a lattice theory, then there's nothing in between. So VJI is the matrix that lives here. But there's no lattice points in between, so there's no notion of x between two lattice sites. So this expression doesn't make sense. Okay, okay, so, so okay, that's what I was wondering. Right, so Vji is what you directly in, in your formulation of field theory if you really live on the lattice. But this is there for the purpose of taking a continuum limit so that I can introduce the gauge field which lives in between so this expression makes sense only when you have the continuum theory. 
So if you go from continuum to lattice, that's the other way you can actually go, then I start with a mu which is defined anyway on space. But now that I would like to do, do discretization of space time, then I integrate this a mu using this path order product to obtain what the link variable is. And this is basically the idea of the same thing as coarse graining we talked about in the, uh, uh, the renormalization group argument, namely that when you actually integrate out the short distance modes, then I integrate out a mu in between, and then after coarse graining, all that's left is VJI. So you can forget about what a mu was supposed to be because you integrate out all those modes, and then you live with VJI directly for the rest of the discussions. So it can go both ways. Does it make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. It's just Good. kind of strange that you can actually even go backwards because you'd imagine that maybe there's multiple connections and I'm not sure how that can guarantee that it's always going to use the same ladder connection. Ah, so that's a fair question. So uh, as always the case, when you do coarse graining, then you integrate out modes which correspond to shorter distances. So in principle, you have forgotten about them, and then your memory is lost, so you don't remember it. So uh, the information is, is completely lost now after you integrate over all the short momentum modes. So the continuum limit I'm talking about is therefore, in some sense, uh, what, what you're trying to recover that is not supposed to be recoverable. So going from continuum to lattice is a fair way of doing it. Going from the lattice to the continuum is in some sense, you're trying to recover what you don't know about, but uh, at least you can uh, take a long range limit of the theory. Then you can regard this link variable, which is sort of discrete living on each of these links, looking from very long distance point of view can be viewed as a continuous function of space. And that's the meaning of the continuum limit. So in principle, you are not literally taking A going to zero actually, but if you take the modes which happens at long distances compared to lattice sites, then you can take the limit where A mu is supposed to be more or less a continuous function on the lowest, uh, on the broad rest uh, long distance scale physics, and that's what it's meant by the continuum limit. So, what you have lost, you can never recover it, but because we often we are interested in the behavioral theory at long distances, then it looks like they, uh, the both link variable in the field become continuous uh, or more or less continuous functions. So that's the spirit of the continuum limit. Yeah, that makes sense, thank you. Okay, good. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, Is it Nick? In, yeah. Okay. Um, so in terms of a, a geometrical picture here, should, should we be imagining like a, a gauge group fiber sitting on top of each lattice site? And That's exactly right. So this is basically what mathematicians call fiber bundle. And the word connection is the word that is used in fiber bundle literature. Mm -hmm. And so that's precisely okay. right. And I have one slide on that later. Okay, so, so is, is this link variable basically like a, a section of, of that? No, the phi is rather the section. So uh, oh, I will yeah. come back and talk okay. about this. The phi, so That's if you have a vector bundle, then phi is mm -hmm. the vector that forms the fiber at each position on the manifold. Mm -hmm. And the VJI is what mathematicians really call the parallel transport. Oh, I see. Okay, so we have an action of the group on the fiber, which mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the, the vector of. Right. Okay. Gotcha. That's right. Okay. So for those of you who haven't heard of the, uh, the nomenclature and fiber bundles, don't worry about it. We are not going to use them really, but I will talk about this connection between the math literature and the physics literature uh, on a couple of slides. Okay, so, uh, so having defined this link variable, we can talk about what is called a plaquette. So uh, I mentioned that this link variable is supposed to be a tra parallel transport. So let's say I start with in two dimensions, the lattice site I comma J. And then using this link variable, I can do the transport, parallel transport of phi going to this nearby lattice point. Then I can go uh, vertically up, so that's the next stage. And then coming back, no, sorry, coming back horizontally. And that's the third line. And then all the way back to original position, that's the last line. 
So all I have done is to take phi using the link variable to go around this square, and, and this square uh, is called a plaquette in the, uh, the lattice uh, field theory uh, language. And, but this may be actually different from phi what you started out with because of something called a curvature going through this plaquette. And the reason why this is called curvature has to do with the analogy to what happens on a curved space. So now we're talking about differential geometry here. So suppose I have a vector at this position on the surface of a sphere. And when you do parallel transport of vector, so I'm assuming this vector is pointing to, uh, towards the North Pole, and I go up on latitude this way. So because the vector is parallel to the direction of the motion, then this vector is always pointing towards the North Pole. And I go all the way to the North Pole, where vector is pointing this way. But then I go down uh, to the equator along this longitude. So this vector is pointing this way. And I do the parallel transport. So it's also pointing sort of uh, uh, in this direction as you do the transport. And then coming down to the equator, now it's pointing this way. And then I, I parallel transport this vector now back to the original position. Then the vector is now pointing that way. So what used to be the vector pointing this way, after doing the parallel transport all the way up to the North Pole, back down on the equator in different position, and then all the way uh, back to the original position, your vector is now pointing to a different direction. And this happens because the surface of the sphere is a curved space. Namely that how much the vector has rotated as a result of the parallel transport has to do with how much this space is curved. And that's why this is called curvature. So if you do the parallel transport around the plaquette, this is meant to be the analog of going to the North Pole, back to the equator, and back to the original position. So that's the analog of the plaquette. And if you do so, what used to be a vector pointing this way is now a vector pointing that way. So it has now changed. In the same way, this field phi after the power transport around the plaquette would actually change as a result of the curvature inside. And the meaning of this curvature is actually nothing but the field strength. Because again, if you use this uh, continuum limit of the product of these link variables, where each link variable is now written as an integral, line integral of the gauge field uh, along this direction. So this first link variable corresponds to the gauge field line integral from here to there, and then from here to there, then here to there, and here to there. So at the end of the day, uh, if this is the Arbelian gauge group, then you can just add what's in the exponent for each of the link variable. So this ends up with a loop integral of the gauge field around this plaquette. And by using the Stokes theorem, the loop integral of the gauge field can be written as the surface integral of the, the field strength, right? So how much phi changes by going around the plaquette is given by the field strength, namely basically the total flux of the field strength emanating through this plaquette. So what is uh, regarded as the curvature in the analogy to this differential geometry uh, is related to actually the field strength in the case of the gauge theory. So, uh, the, so and then you can also even write the, uh, the action for the gauge field on the lattice, namely that I define this product of the four link variables around the plaquette. So this whole thing, product itself is also called plaquette. And if you take the trace, of this plaquette, which is given by this e to the exponential of the field strength, then the, the first piece is of course one uh, in the expansion, and that's just constant, so I don't care. The second piece is f mu nu to the linear order, and, and plus complex conjugate that vanishes, so it disappears. So what remains in the end uh, is this f mu nu squared in expansion of exponential, and you take the trace of it, so that ends up being f mu nu, f mu nu. And by, by writing it this way, it's manifestly clear that this plaquette variable trace is gauge invariant 
because as we talked about before, vi plus one i transforms by u dagger and u here. And transforming of this is u dagger, so they cancel here and then u. This one has u dagger that cancels here and u. And this one transforms u dagger that cancels here and then u over here. And so if you take the trace, then I bring u over here to the end cyclically, so they cancel down here at the end. So trace of the plaquette is gauge invariant. And that reproduces the, uh, the, the kinetic term of the gauge field we introduced earlier in the continuum limit. So the plaquette is, has to do with the field strength going through this square. So the field strength has to do with this idea called curvature. And then using this plaquette variable, you can write the action of the gauge field on the lattice. And now that we have the action for the gauge field, then you can then go ahead and actually put everything on the lattice and then integrate, literally do the path integral on a computer. So that's the idea of how to write the, uh, uh, the gauge field action on the lattice. Uh, any questions about this? Not hearing anything? Okay. So the, 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 what we call the lattice gauge theory is that we really put the gauge field on the lattice. And of course, the lat lattice-sizing it is meant to be an approximation of a continuum space-time for this purpose. So at the end of the day, you would like to regard this lattice spacing to be small enough uh, at the end of the computation. And then you really put the, uh, uh, the, 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 the gauge theory on the lattice and, and actually do a, a numerical integral over the link variable and the fields. And the action, uh, 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 sorry, the, uh, uh, is what actually had the earlier. So this action consists of basically two terms. One of them is this trace of the plaquette, which is meant to give you the, uh, uh, the, uh, the kinetic term for the gauge field. And for the matter field, this is the action we had before. And if you like to add also the mass squared phi star phi, you just add this phi star phi times m squared uh, uh, in addition to this term. So I have the kinetic term for the scalar field from this one. I have the mass term for the scalar field just by writing phi i star phi i. And then I also have this uh, kinetic term for the gauge field as a trace of the plaquette. So I have every bits of pieces for the action. And then you do the integral over phi i on each lattice side, let's go from negative infinity to positive infinity. Uh, and if it's a multi-column, you integrate over each component of the column vector. And Vij is a matrix, a unitary matrix. And there's actually a unique measure called HAR measure, H-A-A-R measure, uh, which defines how you are supposed to integrate over the unitary matrices in a consistent fashion. So everything is well defined, and you can literally do this uh, calculation uh, by numerical integral. So this is the only definition we actually know at this moment, how to define quantum field theory without resorting to perturbation theory of Feynman diagrams. So you can develop perturbation theory with it too, but you don't have to if you're just literally doing this integral over link variable in the fields on the lattice. So this is a non-perturbative definition of what a quantum field theory is supposed to be. And then uh, it also turns out to be the only practical way of doing quantum field theory calculations when you have the strong interactions, which doesn't allow you to do perturbation theory. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, one of the lattice case theory, which is very useful for us, is to take this Vij matrix to be three by three unitary matrices special unitary matrices because the terminal is one. So this is an SU3 gauge theory. And phi i, uh, you have to also define fermions in this context, and that's a little technical, but I don't get into this. But the phi i is now a three-dimensional column vector, and three components of that is called color of the quark fields. And then you literally do the integral of the fermion fields and the link variables to do the computation. And that allows you to actually make a prediction on what kind of bound states would uh, 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 arise in this SU3 gauge theory. And, and they can be compared to the actual real data. 
So what is shown here is all kinds of different bound states made up of quarks bound together by this SU3 gauge interaction, which is very strong, and it doesn't allow you to do perturbation theory for this calculation. But if you literally put this on the lattice and do the numerical calculation, then you can make a prediction on the, the behavior of these bound states, in particular their masses. And then the, 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 you can actually compare that to the experimental data, which is shown by these horizontal bars. The numerical calculation is given by these red points. And this, uh, uh, the gray circle is called input. Because when you do lattice calculation, you don't know what the lattice spacing corresponds to in terms of physical scales. So you need to use a couple of inputs to fix parameters. So in this case, you need at least two inputs, uh, 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 three inputs, I'm sorry, the pi, k, and omega they use for certain bound state uh, spectrum. Because there are three parameters in this theory, namely the coupling constant at the energy scale of the lattice spacing, and the masses of two quarks, and with those three parameters, if you fit that to the data, then you don't have any free parameters anymore. Then the calculation of all the rest of the mass, mass spectrum would be a prediction out of this numerical calculations. And then they seem to completely agree with the data within the accuracy expected in this calculation. So this is an incredible success of actually quantum field theory. So we are talking about quantum field theory, which doesn't allow you to do perturbation theory. But nonetheless, using this geometrical understanding of what gauge theory means, you can define gauge theory on the lattice. And then you can literally do the path integral of a gauge field, with namely the link variable, and matter fields, namely these fields on each lattice site. And you do a numerical in integration over them. And then you use them to make a quantitative predict predictions without resorting to perturbation theory. And that prediction really matches up what we measure in experimental data. So that's the power of defining the gauge theory in this geometrical fashion using link variables. And, and then you can actually put that into practice and to do actually practical computation. And, and the, the, the prediction out of this formulation really beautifully agrees uh, with the experimental data. And I think, uh, uh, yeah, and, but there is a limitation to this formulation because everything here is defined in the Euclidean space. But, and, but if you want to compute some scattering process, like what happens at the Large Hadron Collider, you are scattering protons against protons and your spray of particles will come out. But this is clearly done in, in the Minkowski space because you are following a time sequence of two protons coming in, they collide in the middle and particles come out. So that's certainly not what you can do in Euclidean space. And, and to formulate what happens in this time-dependent process is not easy from the Euclidean formulation. You can try to do it, and that requires basically another continuation on what you compute in Euclidean space to Minkowski space. But that is actually a fairly numerically unstable process. So it's not done in a very reliable fashion so far. So there is still room for perturbation theory. So when you compute various processes at the Large Hadron Collider, the perturbation theory is still the only way to work things out, which also work very well, actually, compared to experiment data, as long as you don't get into the regime where the interaction becomes very strong. But on the other hand, when you look at the phenomena of this bound state spectrum, you're looking at the physics of the strong interaction at actually a long distance scales, or low energies. And as we talked about on Tuesday, uh, the, 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 the coupling constant becomes very strong at low energies, but becomes weak at high energies. So there, there is a very complementarity between the, the two approaches. Namely, if you want to compute processes at the OHC at high energies, coupling constant is small. Therefore, you can resolve the perturbation theory. But when you're looking at the spectrum of these bound states, then you're looking at the long distance, low energy physics, where coupling constant is strong. So you can use perturbation theory. But on the other hand, you can reliably use this lattice formulation using Euclidean uh, the, the QFT to compute these, uh, uh, the mass spectrum. So, uh, and, and so you, we, we actually rely on both of them in the end. Sorry. 
So uh, uh, this is what I was uh, uh, trying to say. So when you're looking at a scattering process, you really need Minkowski formulation. But fortunately, at high energies, the perturbation theory does work. So that's the room for perturbation theory. But when you're looking at the mass spectrum, we are talking about a very strongly coupled low energy physics where coupling constant blows up. So you can't resort to perturbation theory, but instead you use this lattice formulation and make a quantitative predictions out of that. Okay, any questions about this? I'm sure there are questions on this. No? Um, could well, you explain again how do people determine the space of the, the size of the lattice? Yeah, so that's why you have to compare it with some physical observables. Mm -hmm. So the size of the lattice in this case is meant to be just an approximation. So, so you, in the end, you take the limit where the lattice spacing goes to zero. Oh. Okay. But at the same time, the calculation is done with a finite lattice spacing. Mm -hmm. So you need to set up a, do a translation or do you need to set up the dictionary of how to relate the quantity you put, uh, computed on the lattice to something you can really compare to the experimental data. Mm -hmm. So you basically need to set the scale A to some number for this comparison. Mm -hmm. And because of this idea of this renormalization group, when you change the lattice spacing, then the change of the lattice spacing would amount to change of the coupling constants in the theory. Mm. Because if you do one step of coarse graining, then you take the average of, let's say, four lattice sites and combine them into a single lattice site. And, and, and the only price you pay is to change the, the coupling constant in your theory. And I think I forgot to mention that when you write down this uh, lattice action for the gauge field, then the coefficient of this plaquette has the meaning of actually one over coupling constant squared. And it's called beta in analogy to uh, the Boltzmann factor because that appears as a coefficient of the action uh, in the uh, uh, exponential factor in the path integral. But this beta has a meaning of one over coupling constant. So you can, if, in, instead of defining what the lattice spacing is, you can also trade it by the value of this beta because they change together. So by specifying this beta, you basically specified what the lattice constant is. And so if you fix that parameter by comparing to the experimental data, then you have fixed one parameter, namely coupling constant. And in addition, you also need to specify two quark masses in addition to it. And that's how you use these three inputs from data. But then you have fixed basically what the lattice co constant is supposed to be. And then the rest is something that would come out uh, 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 without any further ambiguities. Oh, I see. Okay, does that make, does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Any other questions here? I, I have one. This is Nick. Go ahead. Uh, I, I also think Andres has one in, in the chat, uh, if you wanted to look at that first. Oh, okay. Somehow I cannot look at chat while I'm actually a full screen. Uh, I, I can read it for you. Um, he, was, he was basically asking if, if this is like a supercomputer type of calculation or if this can be done on a pretty normal computer. Um, if you do it the way I described it, it's, it's really supercomputer kind of calculation. And this, this beautiful agreement I'm showing here is really based on supercomputer kind of calculations. It's a very, very heavy numerical uh, computation. And it takes like a month on supercomputer to be able to work out this level of accuracy. So it's a huge calculation. But if you try to be clever, and, and there is a way of improving this uh, lattice action by including higher order uh, the, the pieces in, in the expansion in the lattice constant, you can basically improve the conversions uh, when you try to take the limit of lattice constant going to zero. It's called the improved action. Then even on a laptop, you can get some decent result. You know, not as beautiful as this one, but you can get a decent result. So, uh, so that's how the computer has really made a, a huge improvement over time. So you can do some of these lattice calculations even on your laptop. 
But as I said, to, to really get to this level of accuracy, then you really have to go to a, a big supercomputer to do this. Cool. Um, okay. So, so my question was, uh, in terms of like building this table, uh, like coming out with these these masses in here, it, in terms of actually calculating those masses, is that coming from, say, uh, deriving numerically the two point function and, and then looking for poles or where do those masses come from? Yeah, so that, that you, you, you're very right on this. So what do you do is a compute two point function, but these things are actually bound states. So they correspond to two point functions of some composite operators. So in order to build, for example, this uh, particle called rho, rho is a bound state of let's say up quark and anti up quark. So you use the fermion field, Dirac field for up quark. Uh, let's say that's psi. And rho would correspond to operator psi bar gamma mu psi. That's a vector current because rho is a spin one object. Then you compute two point function of psi bar gamma mu of psi within this path interval in the lattice. And then you ask the question, how that actually scales with the, um, uh, uh, the distance between them. And uh, uh, sorry, I haven't actually connected my app, I, iPad yet, so I, I, I can't. Let me let me see. Um, sorry about that. So uh, if you compute a two-point function, the, the what you're looking at is the uh, the position dependence of the two-point function. And uh, in the Minkowski space formulation, then if you take two operators far away from each other in the time direction, and that will give you basically uh, 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 e to the minus i e t. So that's the the you know the the um, uh, um, uh, the phase coming from the uh, time evolution operator. And I am not logging in somehow. But in the Euclidean space, the exponential, the e to the minus IET phase factor will correspond to exponential damping e to the minus IET. So that's how you can actually, screen. I'm sorry? Uh, we can't see your iPad screen. Yeah, I'm trying to connect it, I'm sorry. I'm still working on that. Um, we can revisit the question in in uh, discussion or something like that if, if you have te technical difficulties now. Okay. Uh, no, no, I, I think I can get connected now. So I stop share. Okay, so what do you do is that you have this integral over the link variable and the integral over the fields and the action. And then as I said, you are computing two point function like this. And this has supposed to have the meaning of creating particle and annihilating particle and going back to the ground state, right? So the two point function and path integral is supposed to correspond to this two point function in the canonical formulation. Then you insert the composition of unity by sum over the complete set of states in between. And this uh, taking to be time direction, this has to do with the um, e to the iht psi bar gamma mu psi of zero, e to the minus iht, and e to the iht acting on the ground state, 
is uh, zero energy. Uh, so you adjust the 0 0.2 to uh, be like this. And this eta minus IHD acts on this uh, intermediate state. So that picks up energy of the intermediate state. So this ends up being N. Like this. So this is the expression in the Minkowski space. And if you go to Euclidean space, then this e to the minus IE turns into exponential damping factor. And when you take T to be rather large, then the only piece that will remain in the end is the least energy state among this complete sum over N. So it gets dominated by just one of the states. Oops. So it gets dominated by only one of the states. Times e to the minus e n t. And energy at rest is nothing but the mass of the particle. So basically, by looking at the limit where t goes to a very large number, then you're looking at the exponential fall of this, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the two-point correlation function. And this exponential, the, the, this is in log scale. Then this exponential fall off gives you the slope, which is nothing but the mass. So that's how you can read off the mass of a state created by a given operator. So what you do is basically to compute this kind of two-point correlation function of various operators you can stick in. And for each operator, you take the limit where the, the interval goes rather large. And as the interval goes large, you can identify this exponential fall off. And you read off the slope of exponential fall off. And that exponential fall off in the, in the end tells you the mass of the state you created from this uh, uh, operator. So that's the, 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 the way you can compute it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's very helpful. Thank right. you. And I see some chats here. Uh, oh, OK, yeah. So, so I, I finally solved the technical problem and connected the iPad. So uh, I, I hope that, that addresses all the problems you had. OK, any other questions? Professor, I have a question. Can you hear okay, me? Liz. Yep. Um, so it, I, I want to check my understanding on Minkowski and Euclidean um, uh, space. Um, I, so I'm sorry, it's not I, Elise. Uh, who is this again? Uh, I'm, I'm Fang. Oh, okay, Fang. Uh, so uh, it, it, it seems to me, uh, so for Minkowski's space, when, we, when, when we're at high energy, where the relativistic uh, effects we we need to consider that then we have to work in the minkowski space well on the other hand when we are at low energy so it's fine for us to stay in euclidean space mm -hmm. uh, this is my current understanding and then uh, uh, from your uh, previous argument uh, at at high energy uh, when the interaction is the the interaction is low, so we can sort of work in the perturb using the perturbation theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and at low energy, uh, we can with strong interactions, we can use this lattice uh, with this use this lattice technique. Mm -hmm. So uh, is is this true? If if we're in a situation where we're at high energy and with strong interaction, then it becomes a really hard problems to. For us uh, so if you are dealing with that kind of theory, yes, then that will become very uh, difficult. But uh, as, as you have, I hope, seen on the B courses, um, I posted the, uh, the, uh, the, the experimental data on how coupling constant behaves as a function of energy scale. Uh, yeah, I think I understand for the uh, QCD, the strong right. interaction is it, mm -hmm. actually really nice. Behave right. in, a, in a really nice way, and mm -hmm. uh, when the energy is high, it's it's it's, it's asymptotic free, mm -hmm. and when the when the when the energy is low, it's uh, it's strong interaction. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I just want to sort of check my understanding is if we encounter the uh, situation where we're at high energy, we need to work in the Minkowski space, mm -hmm. and we're also very unlucky, mm -hmm. and we're a strong interaction. And, oh, uh, I it see. It becomes really hard. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And in that case, that becomes really hard. Yeah. So then you need to figure out how to compute the short distance behavior of the theory uh, using lattice, because that's the only tool we have. And uh, you know, I, I'm not actually aware of how that is actually done uh, in practice. So that's a very good question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, actually, I, I'm just tr trying to uncheck the Minkowski yeah, yeah, yeah. Euclidean mm -hmm. uh, Understanding. Thank good, you. good. So, you know, I appreciate your question. So it's, I'm glad you asked the question. That's a good question anyway. So, uh, so back to the uh, slides. So this is the way that we can define the, uh, the the lattice gauge theory, namely the quantum field theory on the lattice. Now that we have this geometrical understanding of how gauge theory works, and, and this is a demonstration that it does work in practice. By the way, the fact that uh, this N is, is actually the nucleon, namely the protons and neutrons have a mass here, is, is believed to be really a consequence of this strong interaction. So the quark masses, which uh, make up well, the part of the nuclear mass, is actually tiny, only at the level of a uh, uh, percent or so, compared to the mass of the protons and neutrons. So the mass of the proton neutron is actually dominated by the effect coming from the strong interaction, which becomes basically infinitely strong at low energies, as you saw on the plot uh, just a minute ago. So that what you are actually uh, measuring as your weight uh, when you actually put yourself on scale is really the consequence of the strong dynamics going on, uh, you know, literally in your body. Uh, so so that's, that's where we believe the mass of the nucleon actually originates from, which is the dominant mass uh, of the, uh, our, uh, basically every atom. Um, so uh, we will come back and talk more about this uh, uh, as, a, as something called the dimensional transmutation, and, and when, we, when we'll talk about that later on. But anyway, so that's the one fact. And this is actually the, uh, the answer to the question from Nick. So if you take the continuum limit, so let's forget about the lattice for now, the mathematically what we're talking about is this following idea. So what is mathematicians called base manifold is our space time. And on each point on the space manifold, basically space time point, uh, they introduce something called a fiber. And fiber in, in this picture is, is drawn as a one dimensional thing, but it could also be a, a, a multi-dimensional thing. And then you say, this is what is called the vector bundle. Namely that for each point in space time, you have some fiber and you have this fiber, you know, densely populated every on space time point. So you have a bundle of these fibers and hence fiber bundle. And so this is what uh, mathematicians define when you, they actually deal with uh, many different geometrical objects. It's a very universal concept. And so what corresponds to the fiber here is in our case is actually the matter fields. So matter fields form a vector space because it's a multi-component column vector and that's glued on every space-time point and therefore that corresponds to this fiber. So the on space-time, I define a field as a fiber on individual space-time point. So that's exactly what mathematicians talk about as a fiber bundle. But as we talked about already, so you can choose your gauge in such a way that you can choose your basis of your vector space from one space-time point to another in an arbitrary fashion. So the arbitrariness in choosing the, the basis for the vector space is what corresponds to the gauge transformation. And in order to define a fair comparison between the value of the field here and value of the field there, I need to define a parallel transport so that I take this field, so you are living at some particular value here, I bring it to another point by doing parallel transport using this connection, which corresponds to the gauge field. And then you can do a fair comparison between the value here and value there. And that defines the covariant derivative. And if you use the parallel transport around the loop, 
then you can define the curvature, how much your field changes by going around the loop, and that curvature corresponds to the field stream. So that's how we establish the connection between the language of the fiber bundles in mathematics and what we do in the gauge theory in physics. And so this comparison and translation or dictionary turns out to be extremely fruitful because the gauge theory is something uh, it became actually a very important subject also for mathematicians. And uh, they will try to figure out, for example, some exact solutions to the, Max, uh, the Maxwell's equation or Young Mills equation for non abelian case. Uh, they, they, they talk about topology of the gauge fields and so on and so forth. So uh, this became sort of a very uh, interconnected area of research between mathematicians and physicists because of this connection uh, through the gauge field and the fiber bundle. But anyway, so if you are not familiar with this fiber bundle, that's totally okay because we're not going to use this concept very much for the later purposes. But uh, it, it's, it's probably a useful thing to know in case you might want to uh, start doing some research in this area. So the fiber bundle turns out to be a very good language to talk about gauge theory in physics. Okay, so I hope Nick is happy. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, Thank good. Any, any other questions? Okay, so I don't have only three minutes. To, oh, uh, there's a chat. Well, now I find how to, your fiber bundles are cool. Okay, yeah, they are cool indeed, yes. Okay, so now that we define this uh, 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 the, the action, the next thing is, of course, to quantize it. And I don't think I can complete the discussion today, but let me actually get, uh, give you some upshots on what's going to come when you try to quantize the theory. The first thing first, you need to define the five vertices when you develop perturbation theory. And what's new here is this quadratic piece in gauge field inside the field strength. So when you take this trace FF and expand this out, then I have this one squared. That's the usual kinetic term you have for the, the maximum field. But then you have the cross term between this times this. Then I have one, two, three gauge field in there. So that corresponds to this cubic interaction among the gauge bosons. And that's certainly something you didn't have in QED. Photon doesn't interact with the photon. But because the gauge boson in non nebulian gauge theory is a matrix, namely it actually transforms under gauge transformation, and gauge boson is sourced by what it, whatever transform of the gauge transformation. Therefore, gauge field can be sourced by gauge field itself, and hence it would interact with each other. So the Feynman vertex can be worked out based on you know, usual, uh, uh, the usual the formulation. So this derivative turns into the momentum, and you have the structure constant because it's proportional to this one here. There's a coupling constant G to specify the strength of this interaction. So this is the, uh, the triple gauge boson vertex. And when you also go to FF, where you take the, uh, this piece squared, then I have four powers of gauge fields that gives you this four-point interaction. And that gives you two powers of structure constant. So this looks uh, pretty complicated. There's no derivative here, so there's no momentum dependence. The rest is just a metric tensor. So if you have the four gauge bosons uh, among each other, interact among each other, then you get this g squared as a coupling constant here, two powers of structure constant like ff, and bunch of metrics. So this is these are two interactions which you didn't have in Abelian gauge theory. And, and as a result, the gauge theory is what I call sticky because a gauge boson will interact with the gauge boson. So whenever you have a, a process that has a gauge boson in it, that can produce more gauge bosons and additional gauge boson, and then eventually develops into a whole shower of the gauge boson coming out from scattering process. And that's what I call sticky. So the, the, in the case of the non being gauge field, the gauge field is kind of sticky because it keeps producing and multiplying itself in a scattering processes. And that actually makes the calculations awfully difficult in perturbation theory. But nonetheless, that's something we have to do when we deal with the large hadron collider data. In addition, the vertex for the fermion to gauge field also is a little bit modified because A mu here is A mu A times TA. So the Feynman vertex here involves now a matrix TA. And I, I apologize that the notation is can show it as little TA. I'm using capital TA. But anyway, it's the same thing. So the Feynman vertex coming out from this term in a Lagrangian is IG gamma mu 
times the generator coupled to this gauge field that corresponds to generator A. So these are the vertices you will define in non abelian gauge theory. So I stop here. And then the next thing we do is the how to actually uh, develop the perturbation theory with it, where you have to define actually a propagator. That actually turns out to be not a simple problem. And the how to define the propagator turns into the heart of the problem of the gauge fixing. So that's what we would like to discuss on next Tuesday. But anyway, any questions here? I stop here. Um, oh, there's one question. Like, yeah, it seems like uh, typically you would say that the G squared process is higher order, but they kind of both appear. Right yeah, so for, for example, right. when you right. talk about the scattering among the two gauge bosons, this is one piece you have, but you can also use this two, three point coupling twice. So one gauge boson here, another gauge boson here, use another fine vertex here. So that's also, also order G squared. So they contribute at the same order in perturbation theory. So, okay, well, I guess, uh, so let's say you're at high energy so that hmm? you treat G as being small. Mm -hmm. If you were looking at two uh, gauge bosons scattering off each other, you'd mm -hmm. have to include both this uh, four point uh, and also two three points put together. Like That's right, started. right. That's correct. Okay. If you were Good, organizing you got it. Mm -hmm. orders. Right. Okay, and then also it looks like there's a, a clearly like a mass term for the gauge boson right away in F mu nu. Well, there is no mass term in gauge boson from F mu nu, F mu nu. The, the mass term would look like A mu, A mu, but that's forbidden by the gauge invariance. You cannot write a mass term. And that goes to the heart of the discussion when we come back and talk about the Higgs mechanism. When you spontaneously break the gauge symmetry, then you can induce the mass of the gauge boson, but you have to do it in a gauge invariant fashion. And that's where we start needing a Higgs boson, uh, as we have discovered the Large Hadron Collider. So that's something that's gonna come up in the later chapters. I see, so A mu, A nu does not form a mass term. No, well, no. Because it's actually multiplied by something else always. Right. as well i see okay okay any other questions okay so uh, we meet again at 5 p.m later today okay bye for now bye thank you bye, -bye. thank you bye